Good Saturday to you. I'm Zanilo Evangelista, and welcome to our weekly hurricane season videos. It is now March 2nd. We're now into the month of March. And with that, new climate model data and more growing confidence on the hurricane season. And that is basically a sum up of what you need to know for this video. So let's get right into it. First of all, um, as I said, we're into March. Um, getting closer to the hurricane season now down to 91 days. I remember we were just near uh, the 100 day mark just coming past it and now we're down to 90 days. And I'm gonna tell you right now, these next 90 days will be crucial in terms of determining what's gonna happen and how the pattern will set up this hurricane season. Even though a lot of us might be confident and growing in further confidence, um, that the pattern can be very favorable for this hurricane season. We're now, as we like to call it, in the spring predictability barrier, meaning from this time, basically the next 90 days, we're in crunch time now. We're getting closer to the hurricane season and it is fast approaching. And with that, let's take a look at the currency service temperature anomalies updated yesterday, but that is typical for the NOAA Coral Reef Watch. Few things to keep importance. And so, still very warm. We're still in a pretty potent line El Nino at this point. Um, Northern Pacific, though, very interesting. We have these colder spots in the Northern Pacific associated more, more with the colder PDO. That still remains, though, that actually has warmed up in the last several months. Um, but the main focus is down here with the ENSO. That's going to, we're still in El Nino right now, and we're going to talk about more of the future of ENSO in just a bit. But then there's also this part that is the very warm Atlantic. Um, very warm still areas, two, even three Celsius widespread across the tropical Atlantic, unlike anything I've ever seen before. And since we're on that topic about any, unlike anything we've ever seen before, how about we take a look at several years in the past to prove it? Let's go see how it was today, um, this time last year. And man, does one year um, of a difference make, first of all, the Pacific. Of course, we were just entering the El Nino that we were in, so the Pacific was a lot cooler. We had a lot much of a cooler signature off the Pacific coast, a lot more of a classic um, positive PDO signature, negative PDO signature. We're definitely nowhere near positive in the Northern Pacific for sure, but um, the Equatorial Pacific was colder, and we were just starting to see the warmth build for our El Nino off, Central Amer off South America. Um, and the Atlantic. <laughs> this is probably the part that gets me the most, because look at the Atlantic compared to this time last year. And last year is when we really started seeing all these record um, records fall in terms of Atlantic warmth. Look at that, Eastern Atlantic, pay attention to this area um, and compare it from last year, now going to this year and how it looks like two completely different worlds. It almost looks like if somebody dropped a bomb basically in the in the eastern Atlantic, if that's the best way I could describe it, because it's hot, it's boiling, and it obviously doesn't seem like it'll go away anytime soon, at least from what it seems like right now. Um, but let's go take it back even further and let's compare it to some of the active seasons of the kind of the active seasons that we think about when it comes to hurricane season, the main active seasons that we tend to think of when we t when we think of the top years in the Atlantic, at least over the last um, decade or two. First off, going to 05, and even this year, look at, go. let's really quickly go back to here, to 2024, and compare to 05, look at the MDR. And even then, just look at how much warmer we are in the MDR, too. Obviously, climate was a lot colder even as much as only 20 years ago, the oceans have warmed up a lot since, but the Atlantic is significantly warmer. Um, anomalies too, and, th and this says a lot because this at the time, 2005 at the time before we had 2010 and then we had this year, that was at the time the record warm Atlantic that we had, which obviously helped contribute to the super duper active um, 05 season, although I'm pretty sure we don't need explanation for that. Um, but interesting too in the Gulf, look at that. We have uh, the signature with the loop current, which was very present and helped contribute to very strong storms in the Gulf that year. And really quickly taking a peek back at this season. Interestingly enough, we also have that as well. Um, another year, 
um, to look at 2017. We all remember that. And this is a lot more recent. And <laughs> look at this. The MDR out in 2017 wasn't even warm. It was not even warm at all compared to this year, which is off the charts warm. And this is really where the talk of you really need to watch between April and May. And this is why, you know, things could really change between um, spring and the hurricane season. 2017 was one of those really good examples because the MDR was much colder than average in, in March. And also look at all where the warm waters were in the exact opposite areas that we would walk, that we would look for in an active hurricane season. Plus at the time in March in 2017, um, and El Nino was expected that year, that obviously flopped and we ended up having a weak Nina later on in the year, but really just goes to show how things change um, in just a few months. And this all turned around, we had a much warmer MDR by the hurricane season. And then obviously that year, 2017 ended up being historic. And finally, 2020. And now honestly, this is just, I really am kind of blown away because this kind of setup was still warm. And that was actually a theme that we had in 2020, um, a more warm all around look. You can see it obviously, um, very warm near the Azores, the subtropics too were very warm that year. And then obviously off the coast of Africa, there were some pretty good, pretty significant anomalies, a lot more like this year, but obviously the warmth is nowhere near as spread out and as widespread um, over the entire tropical Atlantic. And that year still ended up producing 30 named storms. Just think about it. We had this kind of setup and this produced 30 named storms and compare that to a year like we have with this. And especially with the kind of La Nina that's expected to come on this year, especially according to the latest climate model data from this month, um, and just the beginning of the climate model data because not all of this even come out yet. We still gotta wait as much as a week or so for the rest of the data to come out. But anyways, that's besides the point. Um, the type of La Nina we're getting and the fact that a year like 2020 looked like this in March compared to um, just warmth all around the deep tropics like we have this year, I'm telling you, it's definitely gonna make things very interesting. Um, and with the La Nina, by the way, um, the latest map from the um, TDEF anomalies, and actually I'm a little thrown off because I had the SOI somewhere. Let me actually bring that up, SOI dashboard. I was going to bring it up because I was going to show you SOI is still negative. We'll get to the TDEF anomalies in just a moment. Let me just really quickly bring up the SOI. 30-day um, average, you know, sometimes things goes unplanned. Um, kind of forgot, kind of scrambling around to put all the slides together. But that's besides the point. Now we have the SOI up, 30-day average at negative 13, almost negative 14, um, not, while the 90-day average is still at negative 5. But I'm going to say for right now, for the SOI, honestly, don't really pay attention to it because now that we're in this phase where um, we still have El Nino, but it's weakening, and we still have a negative SOI, all that's really gonna do with westerly winds is stir up any more westerly wind anomalies that we have remaining on the surface. Because let me really quickly show you, look at how we had all these warm anomalies earlier along the, surf along the equatorial subsurface in the Pacific. And as mentioned before, this would help kind of bring all those anomalies to the surface and exhaust them. And now look at what the subsurface is for this El Nino. There's practically no warmth below the surface left for this El Nino to um, survive, to thrive off of. And now we're starting to see the cold pool associated with what will help this La Nina. Now that's beginning to surface. And you could even look at that here in the zonal wind anomalies. This is right along the equatorial Pacific. And look from now till the forecast period, Notice these blues, that is trade winds, and very importantly, look at where that's located on, right near the dateline. And this should help at least begin to, to upwell the subsurface cold anomalies that we have and kind of erase what's left on the Pacific. So as we see these trade winds last, and this should actually last for a good two weeks at least, um, we should see a bunch of these colder anomalies that is below the Pacific still, 
that should begin to surface and it's already beginning to, but I would imagine that would probably appear on the maps that show the surf that show the sub sea surface temperature anomalies on the surface that sh we should probably see that on within the next week or so. And then I would imagine soon this should probably help kickstart La Nina as all the models um, expect. And I don't have the cancips pulled up, but anyway, moving on to the models, I was gonna show something, forgot what it is, but anyway, CFS here. Now to the meat and potatoes, probably what everybody was expecting for when we're, when it comes to climate model talk. Um, here's the CFS and I feel like I was gonna mention that I said that I would save the model run from last month, February, and save it from this month. And this is this month, March 1st. This is what the CFS has. And look at how strong it takes this La Nina down to negative 2.5. That is a that is really strong in terms of La Nina. That would actually qualify for a super Nina, um, just like we just like we call super El Nino if it's above two Celsius. Um, and we've never even had a super Nina before. And so this is interesting that the CFS shows this. And we, if we compare it to what it showed for last month, because I said I would save it, here's February 1st, and it does not even dip below 2 Celsius. So the model between now and last month has trended even stronger in, in the La Nina. And this is not the CFS alone. People say, yes, the CFS might be slightly overblown. Um, but the CFS is not alone in showing a very potent Nina, too. Um, the CANSIPS as well is also very aggressive. Look at this. This is by the World Climate Service tweeted, the latest CANSIPS ensemble has the strongest signal yet for a La Nina next winter. And he mentions years like 1998 and 1973. And 1973 was actually the strongest Nina that we have on record um, for right now, at least within the most recent 50 years. Um, 1973 is the strongest La Nina value that we have. And look at how strong the Cancips has for the Nina 3.4. Dips it all the way down to right near negative, not right near, not not quite negative too, but Cancips as well Um, in pretty good confidence that we will see a strong La Nina, at least with the value below negative 5, negative 1.5, negative five, that would be insane, but negative 1.5, I mean, um, in agreement with the CFS. The CFS has a strong Nina. The CANSIPS also has a signal for a very strong Nina. And obviously, as you would expect, that reflects in the Atlantic. Um, here's the precipitation anomaly forecast, and this is for March. Um, and this basically says it all. Precipitation right through all the deep tropics probably represents um, more storms and definitely more tropical wave activity, um, and I would that, and you could probably make a larger influence that this inference that this probably means the atmosphere is overall favorable for a lot more upward motion, rising motion across the deep tropics in the Atlantic. Um, you would imagine so, especially with how warm it is. And interestingly enough, um, kind of shows how it tracks all the way from the MDR. And the anomalies kind of peak in the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. So you would maybe assume maybe this is trying to show that the Caribbean and Gulf would be in some sort of heightened activity, or at least the activity would be a lot more favorable this year. And then obviously that would mean things could get very interesting for impacts, not only to the United States, but for the Caribbean and the islands too. Practically everywhere, everybody could get at least something this year, at least going off of this model. But overall, this is the CANSIPS, and this basically does show exactly what you want to see in an active hurricane season, especially when you see all these precipitation anomalies um, focused right in the deep tropics, because that's where we look for in terms of the most activity, especially the most intense activity in a season. And, to, to take it even further, look at this drier precipitation anomalies in the subtropics. So that means we probably won't see any sort of stretched situation where the energy is stretched out across the Atlantic from the tropics to the subtropics. And that's actually been an issue over the last few years that we would see the energy kind of scattered out. And that's actually something we did have in 2020. 
yet that year still yield us 30 named storms. And we don't, and at least the CANSIPS is not indicating that in the models this year. Another thing though to look at that I also like to look at, this is the zonal wind anomalies up at 200 millibars. So in the upper atmosphere, and this is another telltale sign of a really active season. Look at all these purples. And this basically means strong upper level easterlies. One thing that would indicate is one, probably a very strong um, African easterly jet. So that would mean stronger and more tropical waves. Hence, probably why the Cancer shows this precipitation look. They probably mean, probably indicate a lot more and stronger tropical waves, which would obviously help um, the formation of more storms. But especially these upper level easterly waves helps reduce upper level easterlies, um, helps reduce shear, which is also an important factor. And most importantly, it helps with outflow too. We kind of see air in the upper levels spreading out instead of coming down, um, in, in which that case, that would also help convective activity. And <laughs> overall, um, if you're not getting what I'm saying, the overall thing to take away is very favorable look. This is, and I've seen multiple people online when I posted this picture, because I've, I've posted this to multiple sites online and people have said and told me that this is basically just as, bad, just as much of a classic look in the upper level zonal wind anomalies as you could get for the Atlantic. And that also does further feed onto the fact that things look very favorable um, this hurricane season. And all the model, all the signals are there, all the climate models um, are very confident and all in agreement as well, which is especially important given, important given it's March and we're slowly beginning to head into that time period um, right before the season where we should start taking these climate models a lot more seriously. Even from February and March though, um, February and January, I should say, when all the models still show this, they were all still very much in agreement of something like this. Um, that is a very favorable look in the Atlantic. They were all still showing that and the fact they still show it more and even more aggressive this month is definitely red flags all the way. And that is something to take away for sure. Not showing the CFS though, because it does basically show the same thing. But if you want to see the CFS, go to tropicaltidbits.com and go to climate models. And you could even just take a look at all the models um, yourself. They all show the same thing. And I would imagine as we get the European, um, the European and the NMME and all those other models, we could go over that next week when they do come out, because they'll probably be out by then. Um, or actually we could segue into this. Or once we do see those models come out, I will post them to Twitter, which this is my Twitter right now. And definitely I would encourage if you follow me on Twitter, if you've not already done so, because see, I actually posted today and I did post yesterday talking about a tweet that Andy Hazleton um, talked about, which related to strong Nina um, in correlation to Atlantic activity. And I post quite a bit, um, even my videos too, whenever I release them, I post that to Twitter. Um, so if you're expecting me to talk about any new climate models that we get between now and next Saturday, when I post, if you're new to my channel, keep in mind I do post every Saturday, I will post them to Twitter and I will have um, discussions with you on Twitter. I will share my thoughts on Twitter about them. And also, if you just want to see whenever I post my thoughts, go to Twitter, just search up my name, Danilo Evangelista, and you can follow me. And that is that. Certainly a lot of interesting things though to go over, especially as we're heading closer towards hurricane season. Again, these next 90 days, we're basically only 90 days away from the season now, that's three months, um, and it's gonna be crunch time. Um, whatever happens between now and the next 90 days will be crucial as to what happens for this hurricane season, any new developments that we get, um, which, but I'm pretty sure at this point, doesn't seem like a lot will change especially since things have really kind of been in the same path that we've been um, since January. And I only expect that that'll probably continue as we head towards the next several months. Um, but we'll see, 90 days away from the season. Um, and you can kind of interpret that in two ways, meaning it's still 90 days away from the season or it's only 90 days away from the season. And I would kind of go, go towards the latter because trust me, 
these next 90 days will fly by really quickly, especially if you're not paying attention. Um, but that will do it for this week's video. If you like what you saw, please, I would really encourage you to like, comment, subscribe, share with family and friends, and help grow the community further. Would always appreciate it. Um, thanks again, and thank you for watching, and we'll see you next week.